Good morning. We are sailing in, 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 into the second day uh, of our workshop. Uh, just two announcements. First, uh, there will be a small uh, reception uh, on Thursday after the poster session at the open terrace here in the main building, the precise time to be determined. And second, uh, this is more important, uh, if you are presenting a poster, there will be a piece of paper outside this room. Please put down your name so that we know how many of you so that we can count the space for posters. Right, and with that, we start our uh, first session, and the chair of the session is Michael Arkiselov, uh, ICTP. Good morning, everyone. Um, we start session of Magnetism One. Uh, there are two talks, and the first talk is given by uh, Gabe Epley uh, from ETH. Now, please. Okay, it's a great uh, pleasure uh, to be here, uh, and. Uh, I really want to thank the organizers for, uh, for inviting me. Uh, it's, uh, of course, uh, an even bigger uh, honor uh, to be here uh, because of uh, Piers, uh, Piers Coleman's uh, birthday. It's, 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 too bad that he, it's, it's too bad that he won't be here. But uh, even though he's not here, uh, I just maybe want it, uh, you know, because there probably will be too many after dinner speeches on Friday. Uh, just to say a few words about, about Piers. Actually, Piers, uh, I've actually known uh, for a very, very long time. This, this is a, a picture, uh, as, as Premi was saying yesterday, she kept referring to the last millennium. Uh, this really is the last millennium. This is in, in uh, 1987. Uh, we were actually both at a meeting in Bangalore. Uh, and and uh, those of you who are old enough can, can remember some of the people who are circled. Uh, you'll notice here, for example, is, Ch is Phil Anderson, uh, Chandra Varma. Uh, and back here is a young man. And, and uh, if you actually blow up that uh, young man, uh, that is the uh, uh, person we're honoring today. That's, that's Piers in 1987. Uh, next to him uh, is, uh, is, is uh, this here. Uh, which uh, I, I had thought that Phil Anderson was his thesis advisor, uh, but maybe, uh, maybe this uh, was a surrogate thesis advisor uh, when Phil was inventing the, the RVB theory. Uh, so so you know, this, is, this is what Piers looked like then. Uh, actually, since that time, I actually first met Piers in the, in the early 80s uh, when I was at Bell Labs and he used to come down uh, from, uh, from Princeton uh, because Phil uh, Anderson was also at Bell Labs, and, and we had, you know, many chats. And actually, these, these many chats uh, led us to actually it's a, a very, very uh, productive collaboration over the next, uh, uh, the, the next decade or so, uh, dealing with the issue of, of quantum criticality, and in particular, uh, trying to understand, essentially, uh, what happened, uh, the different kinds of quantum critical points you could get with an antiferromagnet. In fact, sort of a, here's a sort of a conventional quantum critical point where you, where you cross over between an antiferromagnetically ordered state uh, and a uh, paramagnetic state, as you might think uh, you do in, in chromium. Uh, in some of the heavy fermion uh, systems, however, uh, you would form some kind of a, a strange uh, 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 unbound condo state, which would essentially exist just at the quantum critical point and give rise to all of the funny uh, transport properties. So this figure essentially was uh, sort of became our, our icon for guiding our research for something like a decade. So we had, we had a lot of fun uh, trying, to, uh, trying to, uh, to, to, to study uh, uh, this, uh, this problem, which I think is, is, is still with us today. Uh, now, of course, uh, there have been many other uh, social occasions. I just want to uh, finish here uh, by saying happy birthday to Piers. I, if I do get a chance, I'll make a few more personal remarks on, on Friday. But I think uh, the, the great thing about Piers, and that comes through, I think, in this, this picture, is, is sort of his, his unbridled enthusiasm uh, at, uh, at both uh, social occasions uh, but also at, uh, at sort of in doing serious science. And, and basically the idea is that even though science is serious, it also has to be 
has to be fun. Uh, the whole uh, creativity, and I think Piers' particular creativity derives from essentially this uh, spirit of having, having fun. Uh, and I'm, I'm hoping that, uh, actually, I'm, I'm hoping that everybody here at this workshop is, is having fun thinking about sort of new developments in physics uh, uh, going forward, uh, the way we were having fun uh, together with peers uh, thinking about quantum uh, criticality. Okay, so let me get to the, uh, to the, the hard stuff now. Uh, and this is not so hard. Uh, just uh, talk about uh, some new science that we've been, been doing over the last uh, year or two on, on, on magnetism and try to relate uh, sort of uh, all these concepts, interesting concepts of topology uh, that have been so fruitful for electrons to, to magnetic systems. And uh, the collaborators uh, here are especially Alexander Polatsky, uh, who is basically at various institutions. Uh, and uh, I won't list them all, but actually they're all sort of listed here. Uh, and then his, his various uh, students and postdocs. Uh, also, I'll show some work that uh, uh, we were doing, or I did with uh, Angelos Michalides uh, at the, at, in London, the LCN, uh, and also with collaborators from both the LCN and, and EPFL. Something you already know, I don't need to show this, graphene. So, of course, everybody uh, has, has, has heard this many times before, is graphene is, is this interesting substance uh, where at the uh, Fermi level you can have uh, essentially Dirac particles and uh, the dispersion is given by this uh, famous, uh, uh, this famous uh, cone uh, which exists at the K points in the, in the Brion zone. So that's fermions, so not, not very new, not very exciting. Uh, this uh, is also not very new and not very exciting, but people tend to forget is that of course, in, in the single particle picture, uh, the dispersion uh, for phonons and electrons is essentially the same. And you have for phonons also uh, this type of uh, 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 Dirac-like uh, phenomenon also at the K points because you solve exactly the same uh, equations uh, you know, when you, when you uh, uh, look at uh, the motion of the masses as you do when you look at the motion uh, of electrons. Uh, here, uh, actually, the, the red lines are just simply the uh, 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 calculation for, for uh, an isolated sheet. And then uh, these black points are real, uh, real inelastic x-ray scattering data on a piece of graphite. So uh, people tend to forget that the phonons and, and the electrons look the same. Uh, you can, of course, also uh, create any kind of honeycomb lattice and uh, find uh, these Dirac-like uh, uh, Dirac -like cones. Uh, basically, the, the, the reason they arise is, is that I have a number of a lattice, and then if I have uh, proper symmetry protection in this number of a lattice, I can get essentially a band crossing at the K points. You could even do it for artificial uh, materials such as uh, uh, quantum dots. Uh, where you can look at essentially exoton polariton uh, condensates, for example, on such uh, honeycomb lattices. Uh, now, last but not least, and this has been sort of neglected, uh, sort of one of the most popular bosons, especially with the people in this room uh, who've been coming to Pierce's meetings over the years, is magnons, magnetic excitations. And again, the, if you linearize equations of motion here, uh, you again get uh, this, uh, uh, these uh, uh, spectra, or these uh, eigenfrequencies as a function of, of uh, momentum. And again, at the K points, you get your uh, uh, Dirac cones. And uh, so basically, this raises the question, is that there are fermionic systems, but actually there are which are just electrons, for example, in, in graphene and its analogs. Uh, but, uh, those are fermions with long-range interactions. And there's an interesting question of if uh, when you start to deal with interaction effects, the similarities between the bosonic systems and the fermionic systems uh, go on. So from a spectroscopic point of view, 
I've just shown you there's really no difference between the fermionic systems and the, and the bosonic systems. You get uh, essentially for essentially these linearized excitations, there's no difference. And it's really fair to ask, is, is there any difference uh, when, you, when you put in interactions? Is there any difference uh, when you think about the statistics of the quasi-particles that you're interested in? And so the rest of the talk, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to deal with this. Question. So I'm going to talk about the nonlinear effects. So linear looks boring and the same. What about the interaction effects? And what about the surface states, edge states? Okay, so the key thing, of course, is in, in the key thing that gives rise to these cones is the fact that you have a non brevet lattice. Once you have a non brevet lattice, of course, the block function uh, the, the, is, is no longer just simply a scalar, but it's an interesting vector, uh, which then uh, obeys, uh, in particular simple cases, the Dirac equation, or more complex cases, some kind of a wild uh, equation. So here's a number of a lattice. And uh, when you think about magnons, uh, of course, uh, you can convert the magnon problem into any of these other linearized excitation problems using the holstein uh, primakov uh, transformation. Uh, so you start off here uh, with the usual Hamiltonian. Uh, and then you uh, essentially write uh, the spin raising and lowering operators in terms of uh, uh, basically bosonic annihilation and creation operators. And there's a crucial thing here that Fz actually is S minus A dagger A, which of course produces uh, a nonlinearity which you throw out to first order. And, uh, but if you, if you keep only the linear order terms, then you have a Hamiltonian, effective Hamiltonian in these degrees of freedom which, of course, exist on the two sublattices. So if you wish, there's an A and a B for the two sublattices. And this Hamiltonian consists of essentially just uh, J times S. And then this term here, which is in encapsulates the momentum dependence, the interesting momentum dependence, which gives you those Dirac cones at the uh, K points. And then there's a diagonal term here, which is 3. Okay, that's actually not going to be unimportant. So this is just standard. Thing. And this is how you convert your uh, eigenvalue uh, problem uh, for the spin case into an eigenvalue problem, which looks very similar to that for fermions, for fermions, or in fact for phonons. So this is the three that important. There's a, there's a diagonal piece, and that gives you. Excuse me. You're yes. Yes. I'm expanding around the fermionic graph state. So that's what you get. So this is why you get the same thing that you got before. The three, the three there, which is the diagonal term, which it effectively comes about because you can have multiple occupancy, if you wish, of the sites rather than single occupancy. Uh, it just shifts the energy of the spectrum. And you just get, again, this famous form as if it were uh, graphene, electrons and graphene. Now, Let's think about the interaction effects. So there's a, a rather famous result uh, for the uh, uh, for electron-electron interactions for the for graphene, uh, which I just summarize here. Is there are in fact uh, self-energy corrections due uh, to the Coulomb interaction, and that's uh, the calculation is actually just shown here. It just comes about from this diagram. You get essentially a, a creation of electron uh, hole pairs mediated by the Coulomb interaction. At the end of the day, though, you get what amounts to an integral, basically, of this, of this form here. And of course, that form uh, gives you a logarithmic uh, correction to the uh, velocity. So in fact, the velocity with electron-electron interactions does, uh, is actually not constant as you go towards the Dirac point. It actually diverges logarithmically. Effectively, you're just dealing with a 2D transform of a, of a Coulomb potential. And what this means is that you don't have a Dirac cone. You actually have a Dirac hourglass but with the interaction effects. And, and this Dirac hourglass uh, was seen uh, already seven years ago uh, by Andre Geim. Uh, he actually measured the velocity, which you can do by changing the chemical potential uh, with a gate. Uh, and sure enough, it uh, more or less agreed with this uh, logarithmically 
diverging effect that was predicted. Okay, so uh, you, we know, of course, that with the magnons also, there are these corrections. Remember, I said that SZ actually was involved actually not an A dagger, but an A dagger A. So there's a number of operators, so when you reinsert that into the original Hamiltonian, you, of course, generate uh, terms which are not just quadratic uh, in, the, in the A and B sublattice operators, but also actually uh, come in uh, to higher order. And so we have to start thinking about the correction terms here. Uh, the correction terms, of course, is spin raising and spin lowering operators as well. And uh, so you can start to expand uh, the, the Hamiltonian uh, uh, in these operators. And you get, of course, all manner of terms, but particularly you get all these uh, fourth order terms, uh, which uh, essentially couple uh, the two uh, sublattices together. Notice that they never appear uh, by themselves, so you never, you never get a, a, an A to the fourth type term uh, to this order, uh, because of course we're dealing with only the case of nearest neighbor interactions, and the nearest neighbor interactions are strictly between the two sublattices, not within a particular sublattice. So you have all of these extra uh, interaction terms, and of course here, uh, we have well-known processes from uh, just many body physics to try to correct the self-energies. And of course, you have a Hartree diagram, uh, which, as you'll remember, just simply produces a, a shift of the energy. And then you have these rainbow uh, diagrams, which we'll talk about a little bit more in a moment. And so uh, we go ahead and calculate. This is the Hartree correction. Uh, this is just this uh, shift of the self-energy. Uh, it scales essentially like the population squared of the magnons, mainly the zone center magnons. And the uh, correction term is exactly this. That's the interaction, uh, that's the spin, and that's pi. You can see, of course, that as s gets smaller, the corrections get smaller, get bigger. It just goes as 1 over s to the third. OK, so that's what we've got. Now, what about this diagram? So this diagram, again, is quite simple to write down. It's uh, simply uh, self-energy correction here. Again, scales essentially like this uh, population factor uh, times uh, a matrix element uh, divided by this uh, uh, energy denominator where energy has to be conserved going through this thing here. And uh, in other words, one can then consider uh, here that, of course, you can calculate uh, both the real and uh, imaginary parts of this. The imaginary part gives you decay rates, and the real part gives you a spectrum renormalization. Uh, you should remember that if I have a Bravais lattice, such as uh, a square lattice or a cube, uh, Dyson showed essentially that the, the correction, uh, this correction here, uh, again, uh, was simply a constant. And so let's look at the, these two. Uh, uh, let's just try to understand how the calculation uh, actually works out. So it's, it, uh, here are the two uh, uh, integrals that one can consider just to think about what's going on. So this is the real integral, which has matrix element effects plus uh, this energy conservation, uh, 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 energy conserving delta function. And this is just this uh, density of states, uh, which just takes account of the delta function without thinking too deeply about the matrix elements. Of course, you know that from ferromagnets, the matrix elements generically are, are, are weakly momentum dependent, if at all. So it's, if you want to build intuition, really, you can build intuition just by looking at this particular integral. And, and so uh, one can then go ahead and calculate these two uh, functions. The, uh, the solid lines are the density, uh, are, are just simply the, the density of states, and the dashed lines have the matrix elements in it. You can see that there's actually relatively little difference. Uh, the more, uh, to get even more sort of uh, into this uh, understanding of what's going on here, because you can see that when you calculate those integrals, uh, uh, there are actually quite uh, a few uh, singularities in momentum space. These are van Hove type singularities, uh, which are gotten essentially from kinematic constraints. So all of the singular behavior here 
you see both in the density of states and in the matrix element weighted density of states, which is the self-energy. You see them in both, uh, in both terms. And, and what you can see is there's, there are singularities at these uh, important symmetry points in the zone, and uh, those singularities appear in both functions, uh, both the density of states and the self-energy. So basically, you're dealing with Van Hove singularities. And these Van Hove singularities come about uh, uh, in, a, in a way that's uh, shown diagrammatically here at left. So you have to be a little bit careful here. So there's various uh, colors here, which correspond to different momentum uh, points in, in momentum space. And then what I'm showing you here at, is, is coded to the same color as the contours along which that delta function enforces energy conservation for those particular values of the initial magnon energy momentum. And, and what you see here is, is that as you, uh, depending on uh, whether you look for, let's say, uh, the up to the up-down band. Remember, there are two bands because I have two sublattices. Those are the A and B operators. Uh, this is, for, for in this case, these contours evolve a particular way as I move through the zone, as I change uh, the colors here. Uh, the most interesting one is D going to D plus D, so that if I move, for example, from this point in K space, this is the contour where I find uh, the spectral weight which matters for the self-energy. Then if I just move a little bit over here, that contour comes across, and then the purple one at the K point jumps here. And when, of course, there are these jumps in these equal energy contours is where I have my von Hofer singularities. So I have singular behavior. In particular, I have singular behavior at the K point at the end of the day. And so one can ask, uh, here again, it's just drawn in, in more detail what these rainbow terms do. And I just showed you uh, now just, not just the imaginary part, which was shown before, but also the real part. Again, I see these singularities in the real part. And I see this curious sort of double singularities uh, near the K point. So there's this minimum and then these two maxima around it. So that's a rather curious structure, very different from what I get for Coulomb interactions for the electrons. And so if I really blow up the region near the K point to look at the many body renormalization effects, what I see for the Coulomb interactions and fermions, I see this uh, hourglass shape, logarithmic, whereas actually I see something very different for the magnons. I actually still see, uh, a, of course, a, a shift in the, uh, in, the, in, the, in the Dirac point. I see uh, linear behavior at the, going through the Dirac point. And then I see these, uh, these odd-looking uh, singularities coming from uh, the Van Hove effects, which I just described a minute ago. So uh, there seem to be very different many-body effects in the case of the fermions on graphene versus the magnons on the same honeycomb lattice, even though I started off, of course, with the lowest order of the same uh, excitation uh, eigenfrequencies. And so the question is, does this have anything to do with reality? Well, it does. It, it turns out that about 50 or 60 years ago, these materials are very popular. These are transition metal trihalides, uh, which consist essentially of a honeycomb layers of transition metals. They're indicated by the, uh, the gray uh, spheres, okay, which are sandwiched essentially between uh, layers of the, of the halides, for instance, bromine or chlorine which are denoted in purple. So I have, nice, I have a nice van der Waals magnetic analog of graphene. And, and these, uh, the renormalization of the spin waves in these materials was a topic 50 years ago. This is a paper uh, from 1971 uh, when I can make the usual remark that uh, most of you were not born then and, and I was not even uh, I was still wearing short pants. Uh, so uh, this paper, actually, when we started, uh, I, when I last checked, actually was cited only five times. It's actually a very, very pretty paper. And what these guys did is they did neutron scattering measurements uh, on a very large crystal of this material. And, and they did the usual thing. These are just neutron data. They don't look any different today than they looked then. You, you, you fix, for example, the momentum. 
scattered energy, and you can see the eigenfrequencies, you can see peaks, uh, just like people do nowadays, so nothing has changed. The mass of the neutron hasn't changed, uh, and uh, neither has its spin, which is crucial for these experiments. Uh, and, and they actually had this diagram in the paper, this Dirac crossing here, uh, and this is the K point. And uh, what they found was when they measured the eigenfrequencies near that K point, they found very curious behavior. What they thought was very curious is, is here is the, here, here is this, uh, here's the, the K point indicated by the, the red line. And they saw a renormalization. And, and of course, the error bars occur these days are pretty large. But what you see is, is there's, there's a fairly substantial renormalization of the spin wave uh, energy which is uh, quite momentum dependent near, uh, near the K point. And, and then it looks like there's a maximum just a little bit away from the K point, and then uh, it, it goes down again, and then there are large error bars here near the gamma point. Okay, so that was not explained at the time and just parked. And when we uh, picked this up again and did our theory, uh, we then actually tried to overlay the theory, which has, of course, exact coefficients out in front, and here I've just replotted the data from 1971. And this is the theory with all these Van Hove effects. And sure enough, uh, the Van Hove singularity actually counts precisely, extremely well for these uh, old data. So this is the renormalization, the renormalized uh, the dispersion relation near that point. So uh, actually, uh, the interesting thing here is you could say that the renormalization of uh, essentially a, a Dirac particle due to many body effects was first measured 50 years, or in this case, 40 years before Guy measured it uh, with his collaborators uh, for fermions and graphene. Uh, as I say, the other interesting thing is, is a citation uh, index uh, is, is, a, is, is, is a very interesting guide to what you should be looking for, uh, new physics. And you should be looking at papers with very few citations and uh, exhume them. Uh, 50 years later. This is actually a very beautiful paper. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think they didn't, they just simply didn't have the, the ability to do those. No, they, they tried going, going beyond. But they, if Silberglit, did, they did do, do, try to do calculations, but I think they were just not able to do the integrals. But they knew you should be doing those integrals. Of course, the Holstein-Primakov thing existed when you and I were uh, wearing short pants <laughs> when you were very small. So it's, a, it's an amusing sort of history of science thing. But it's also amusing uh, just, just to, to read these, this whole paper, because there's a lot of physics there which these guys actually understood. But basically, that resolved that old mystery. OK. Now. What happens when these bosons? Uh, so this is the sort of the next order in this uh, in, in this theory. Uh, what happens, of course, when the amplitudes become even larger? Well, then you enter uh, what we sort of like to call a nonlinear regime. And I'm just going to breeze uh, breeze through this because uh, here, uh, of course, in one dimension you enter the regime of of uh, solitary waves. In two dimensions you enter the re regime. Of, of sort of large-scale discommensurations. Uh, you enter an interesting regime of, of nonlinear dynamics. And uh, one can ask this question uh, for the uh, bosonic systems. In this case, actually, we had tried to answer this question for graphene, which has been stretched. Okay. And it turns out that graphene, which has been stretched, if you do molecular dynamics on it, actually has, in addition to the linear excitations has these nonlinear solitonic type excitations, uh, which uh, look like that, essentially, which look like, like very, very large uh, waves. And with very, very large uh, displacements. And these uh, large uh, displacement uh, waves, solitary waves, actually show up uh, when you uh, essentially uh, stretch Essentially, when you, when you stretch the material and you look for the elementary excitations just in the molecular dynamics calculations, that actually, if you look, you find out that there are very long-lived, actually, large amplitude excitations, which are not simple 
phonons. This is now for phonons. We suspect something similar might happen for the magnons. So we're expecting that there might actually be uh, nonlinear phenomena in these especially low dimensional magnetic systems which will be analogous to this. Now, the reason we were working on this problem with phonons was that we were interested in the amazing ability of graphene actually to carry water bubbles on its surface. And this was related to uh, the problem actually of using uh, graphene uh, in uh, biological sensing systems and water filters. But the, 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 mo the main point here is that in addition to the spin waves, the spin wave approximation does not account for all of the qualitative features uh, that one would expect, and we're certainly hoping people will look for the nonlinear excitations in the uh, magnetic uh, uh, van der Waals solids. Okay, so what might these nonlinear excitations be good for? Well, as I was saying before, uh, these nonlinear excitations are very good for carrying water. Uh, we suspect that perhaps in the uh, uh, in the case of uh, the magnetic systems, they may be good for uh, carrying uh, charge around. I won't go into this because I'm running out of time. Uh, in fact, there's another interesting thing about these uh, large amplitude ripples rather than the low amplitude, the, the, that low amplitude uh, uh, phonons is, is that what we discovered a number of years ago is that if you have uh, large amplitude ripples, uh, you can actually destroy charge density wave states in graphene, which are present uh, when, when you have very flat pieces of graphite. Uh, you can get beautiful uh, charge density waves. Whereas if you crumple the graphite, in other words, if there are these large amplitude excitations, actually uh, you can get, uh, uh, you actually destroy the, uh, destroy the charge density waves. Uh, which implies, again, that, that if these ripples are moving around, these nonlinear, uh, these, solitary, these soliton type excitations, which arise when you go to nonlinear order, uh, are, are strongly coupled to, to the electronic degrees of freedom. And actually, we think that might give rise to some interesting new physics uh, over the next few years. Uh, this just shows the same picture in reciprocal space. Uh, and this shows uh, essentially the two classes of of, of samples, this is two types of uh, doped graph graphene. Uh, they're all doped in the same way, uh, but the samples which have charge density waves are the ones uh, where the, uh, the fluctuations, the, 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 the surfaces are very flat. There are no ripples around, uh, whereas uh, the ones which don't have charge density waves have surfaces uh, with much greater roughness. It just shows the uh, the, the, the height spectrum of the material, okay, which you just measure with STM in this case. So if, the, uh, if you have a very rough surface, there's no charge density wave, lots of ripples, lots of these nonlinear excitations, uh, very flat, you get this. So I think there's going to be some interesting electron phonon, electron magnon physics uh, coming up soon in this field. Now, the other thing, of course, that's happened recently is people have rediscovered, not just ourselves, have rediscovered these transition metal trihalides, and they find uh, very uh, curious uh, ferromagnetic behavior and also layered anti-ferromagnetic behavior in single flakes of chromium uh, triiodide. So these materials have come back. Uh, they have very, very large optical rotations, so they're very amenable to doing physics. Again, uh, the uh, uh, transition temperatures also uh, uh, depend on uh, the number of layers that you have, so there's some uh, detailed sort of uh, physics to do with the couplings between the layers as well. So just wanted to introduce sort of this topic a bit. Uh, let me just conclude uh, with, with one particular very simple demonstration of where fermions and bosons are different, going back to that three that I mentioned at the beginning, uh, different between the... Uh, basically graphene, and these, uh, these uh, layered uh, honeycomb uh, ferromagnets. So this is, again, the honeycomb lattice. And I have two sublattices. And now if I think about assembling this into three-dimensional structure, uh, what I get is, of course, uh, the possibility. These are the different uh, stacking sequences that I can have, A, B, A, A, B, C, and so on. And what you'll notice, in particular, 
is that if I think about that last layer, uh, that last layer could have one sublattice, for instance, in this case, uh, the, uh, in this case uh, the, the blue ones in the last layer could be decoupled from everything underneath. Okay. So I have a surface, I have one isolated sublattice at the surface, a B sublattice. So if I think about the, the, now the consequences of that when I have bosons rather than fermions is of course uh, that if I consider this, uh, this Hamiltonian here, of course I have my usual uh, in contrast uh, to what happens for the fermions, it, of course I have these off-diagonal terms as always for the fermions, but in addition to that I have this famous S plus, uh, this famous term derived from SZ, SZ. So what that means is that I do have actually a, a B sublattice term living by itself at the surface, okay, which is not present in the fermionic case. So I have a B sublattice term, and of course that B sublattice term now, this uh, diagonal term is, is, is missing in the case of the fermions, but is present in the case of the, of the bosons. That's that three. And of course that three combined with a weak uh, coupling down below actually gives rise to a dispersive surface state. Which is, uh, which is non-dispersive in the case of graphene, but is dispersive in the case of the, uh, of the magnons. So I could get actually surface magnons, which are qualitatively different uh, than, uh, than what I get for the surface fermions in the case of a terminated, uh, uh, terminated uh, graphene-like uh, structure. And of course you can do this all by, uh, you can check this for yourself by doing uh, sort of a classic slab calculation. And again, the key point here is that I have this, uh, uh, this three, which is not zero. And as I say, when you do this slab calculation, you get what I just showed you, and I think I'm about to run out of time. Uh, of course, this, uh, what uh, the slab does for you also, it tells you how this K point wanders around in three dimensional space as a function of uh, KZ. Uh, so it twists around and of course that twist as it goes around uh, is related to the chirality of the interaction. So what this means among other things is that if you have for example a jalosinski maria interaction, you would break the degeneracies between uh, basically right-handed and left-handed polarized uh, uh, k-point trajectories, and that in turn would actually also gap out the uh, Dirac spectrum at the k-point. Okay, so let me conclude. Uh, I've shown you sort of the excitement now of moving from fermions to bosons. Bosonic Dirac materials actually are not exotic at all. I would almost claim that they're much more common than the fermionic variety. There's so many things. There's phonons, polaritons, magnons. And particularly, uh, we've recently uh, rediscovered these transition metal uh, trihalides, uh, which are van der Waals materials, so you could isolate them and do all kinds of physics with one, two, three, and four, and so on, and layers. Combine them also with other van der Waals materials in heterostructures, if you like. There's a lot of new physics, including dispersive surface states, which did not exist uh, for uh, the simple uh, graphene model. Uh, we have also shown you that there are corrections to the self-energy of, of a very different kind that you can discover in these materials, a very different kind than you can discover for the, uh, uh, for, 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 uh, for the electron systems. And the last thing is that solitons, actually not only do you have uh, sort of interesting corrections to the linear theory, you also have uh, nonlinear excitations which show up at large amplitudes. And, and these actually have some, if you wish, practical use. Uh, they can carry water, but I'd like you also to think about how they might be able to carry uh, uh, charge excitations along. Uh, thank you very much. So thank you very much.